Hafe de Toro Samzo, Nananhu si Mike Luhan Bavakwa, Gwawi Curator Pari Museo Nguahan, Magov Zu, Gagi Zuguini, at Soka Virtual Zu, Pari Bequintu Siamzu, Pari Historian, E Museo Nguahan. I'm happy to be here, although it may be virtually. Um, I'm Mohun Nagai Gizu, Zamanhi Hita Gizu, Saipan, Ibunitu Neslan Saipan. I wish I was there with all of you, but I'm happy to be able to join virtually to talk about the history of the Guam Museum. I'm happy to be joining on this panel my colleagues from the Guam Cultural Repository to share about uh, the history of the Guam Museum, but then also why the that history and also the obstacles which have appeared in the past, but also the current obstacles of the Guam Museum. Some of its limitations lead to the necessity of an institution like the Guam Cultural Repository. And so um, you can see in this slide, uh, on this first slide here, Guini Gestina Primetna slide, uh, you have different incarnations of the Guam Museum over the years, from the pre-World War II era to the Garden House era, to this image here featuring Tony Palomo, who was the administrator of the Guam Museum and who the Guam Museum is named for today. This is the time when there was no Guam Museum. There was a collection, but no real home for it. To then sort of the design for the, the Guam Museum as it is today in its permanent facility in Hagatnya. And so, Nihita Tutuhan. So the first documented discussion around the idea of a Guam Museum comes in the 1920s, 1926 in particular. You have this article from the Guam Recorder, Guam to have a museum. And so for a little bit of historical context, this is the 1920s. This is when um, Chamorros, you know, are experiencing rapid changes to their to their island rapid changes to their culture because of Americanization. Um, and so there was this feeling, like many indigenous people in a modern context, there was this feeling that their heritage would be lost, you know, that um, sort of pressures to Americanize, pressures to modernize, pressures to assimilate. Um, all of these things were leading Chamorros to feel that the culture that they had known, but also sort of the ways that they were connected to their past these things might disappear. These things might be lost as construction of roads, military facilities, the expansion of villages. All of this might mean artifacts being lost and uh, other things being lost as well. And so the museum is seen as sort of this, this, this way to stop that loss. And this is a common sort of thing. Indigenous people in a modern context often feel like they are going to, they are disappearing because of how their entrance into modernity sort of uh, marks them as, as communities that are always already gone, right? That their culture is dying, their language is dying, they're losing their land, all of these things. And so the Guam Museum at this time is, is really just driven by this feeling like who the Chamorro people are at that time might be lost. So let us create a museum in which we can collect things to represent that before it's too late. Uh, Ramon Sablan was one of the key people who was mentioned at that time. And so the Guam Museum is opened. It is 91 years now since the Guam Museum was officially opened. At first, the American Legion volunteers opened it. Soon, the U.S. Navy took over the Guam Museum. And the Guam Museum at this time really had two sort of functions in the community. When it was originally started, actually, despite the discussion from Ramon Sablan and the Guam teachers in terms of their desires for a museum, it was really started with the impetus of providing a space for visitors to the island to see artifacts, to get a sense of Chamorro culture, and so on. So people who were visiting, whether it was for a day or for a few weeks, the museum was a place that they could they could visit. Um, eventually, though, that was eclipsed by the fact that as time went on, as we get closer to the start of World War II, Chamorros feel a stronger sense of ownership over the museum. This is driven, of course, by people like Agatha Johnston, who continue to sort of push for the collection of artifacts. Um, you know, um, and so even something as simple as uh so when I hear descriptions about the Guam Museum at this time, 
you know, some one of my favorite descriptions is just that um, teachers in the public school system, for example, when wanting to teach a little bit of history, but a little bit of art as well, would take their students to the Guam Museum, and then they would give them paper and they would have them sketch artifacts that were in the cases. And so here, remember that the museum is driven by this desire to collect things because they might be lost soon. The Chamorro people might disappear soon. Remember that everyone spoke, Chamorro, you know, all Chamorros pretty much spoke Chamorro at this time in Guam, but there was at the same time this feeling that the loss was coming, that sort of the connection, the, these connections that Chamorros had had for multiple generations now under the Spanish, that they were being, they were being uh, threatened, they were being disrupted by Americanization. And the museum was create something to stand to represent the people, even if these things are lost. And so really that Chamorro dimension at that time is create something so that the children of the future who may not be able to see Lati stones behind their houses, or who may not understand how a lusong or a matati works, who may not be able to weave things, who may not need to carve things the way uh, their ancestors have in the past, that they can go into this facility and see those parts of their heritage. Now, the Guam Museum is destroyed in World War II. There's plundering by the Japanese occupying forces, but it's also uh, destroyed in the American uh, reinvasion, the bombardment. And so it is not until 10 years after the occupation is over that the museum reopens so this is from the Guam Daily News at that time. Um, now, the Guam Museum was really, uh, there was the Guam Historical Club, the Guam Historical Society. These uh, were people, two of, uh, a few of the most notable names associated with that, are, of course, Mariquita and Paul Souter, but also Cynthia Johnston, Rosalia Langford. You know, these were people who had had great interest in Guam's history and sharing it and talking about it. So they pushed from the community, sort of the need for a museum in 1954, eventually this happened. And, and in line with sort of a theme throughout this. So the museum is under the, the division of parks, like Parks and Rec at this time. So it is government sort of authorized. It's a government facility, but there's no funding for staff, which means community groups, the Guam Historical Club, and most importantly, the Guam Women's Club are the ones who actually run the museum. <clears throat> um, before I go on, though, I, I did want to mention one of the things that I love about this is that it mentioned, here it mentions that the first permanent loan to the museum after it reopens was from Jose Camacho, who donated an earthenware water jug, bronze coffee pot, and a bra and a pair of bronze candlesticks. Zahuano. Zahuano, I love that sort of that is a piece of trivia that we can we can share into the future. And so the, the post-World War II Guam Museum is put in this house here, known as the Garden House, which is one of the oldest buildings in Guam, uh, built during the 1700s, and one of the few areas that survived the bombardment of the Spanish plaza, uh, the Spanish governor's house, excuse me, in Hagatnya. And so Thelma Glenn, who's right here, uh, she was the most recognizable face from that because she was, for many years, the only employee of the Guam Museum. She started off as a volunteer and then later became a, uh, a part-time and then a full-time employee for the museum. <clears throat> now, as you can see here, when you look at this facility, this, this building is quite old. It's not particularly large either. And so even within 10 years after opening, it was already clear that this might not be a great facility and certainly not a permanent facility for the Guam Museum. And this leads us to Carlos P. Titano, who in 1965, who's the speaker of the Guam legislature, he, you know, he said that he publicly came out saying that there was there was a need to stir up interest in the museum. And so what he talked about is that the Guam Museum at that time in the, in the garden house was crowded and old fashioned. 
and that it was not uh, sufficient to meet the needs either of the island as it was developing and increasing in, in population, or sort of the desire on the horizon was that there be a tourist industry for Guam. And the museum certainly wasn't enough for the increasing number of uh, public school children who needed a place to go for field trips, but you know couldn't all squeeze into that cramped uh, garden house. But it certainly wouldn't be enough if if tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of tourists came to Guam and then had to squeeze into this sort of squalid, small building. And so what Titano proposed was a two-story edifice of Spanish design should be built. The ground floor may be used for object display and the top floor to include office space, restrooms, and a lecture room with a stage where film slides and motion pictures can be shown. His idea was, of course, that the, the Spanish governor's palace be rebuilt and that uh, and that that can then be used as a permanent museum space. <clears throat> now, what Titano is suggesting here, interestingly enough, it it comes true to to some extent, but it does take a while. Remember, this is in nineteen sixty five, and it would take about fifty years for this dream of his to be realized. Now. Going back to some of the logistics of the Guam Museum. So when the Guam Museum is reopened in 1954, it is under the Park Service for Guam, or Parks and Rec the, for Guam. In time, however, it is transferred out of Parks and, Rec, Parks and Rec into the public library system, and it becomes sort of a, a division of the public library. So you can see here, this is a Guam Museum exhibit in the public, in the library, um, and so this is sort of from 1988, where museum and library events would be listed side by side um, in the newspaper. And so the, the, the library and sort of ran the museum. The museum was still for a time in the garden house until eventually that facility was closed. Um, but so, so Part of the museum being under the library, though, meant that it's even while its facilities itself and um, remained pretty much the same with the garden house, although it did. The museum also could make use of the facilities of the library because they were now the same entity. Um, and that sort of this transfer did lead to occasionally more staff being hired, it's oftentimes for short sort of short segments. But what we see under this time is that, or during this time, is that there's a huge increase in the potential mandated responsibilities of the Guam Museum, and that the Guam Museum becomes the the depository for artifacts from Guam's history. Um, the The Guam Museum, because it's part of the library, also because it becomes attached to it, it gains archival mandates as well that it's supposed to also be an archive. But what happens, though, is that as the Guam Museum is expanding, its, its collection is growing, its responsibilities are growing, it's not necessarily, those growing responsibilities are not matched in terms of its facilities, in terms of its resources, and in terms of its staff. Eventually, the Guam Museum has made its own agency. It is for it is for a time placed in Adaloop, um, behind uh near where the excuse me behind Adaloop near where the Laddie of Freedom is today. However, that is eventually closed, and this is the start of the time where there the Guam Museum is a collection that does not have a museum. The Guam Museum basically becomes uh homeless. It has no permanent facility. It is a collection that moves from area to area. And as you can see here, the museum creates temporary exhibits, temporary uh, facilities where it can put things on display. But ultimately, it is constantly in transit, um, sort of cut off from the public in places, uh, you know, where, which may not be ideal in terms of what it's supposed to be collecting, what it's supposed to be maintaining. And so this is 
So as I said, the museum has increased in responsibilities, increased in what it's supposed to do. Um, it gets a few more staff, but it also loses a permanent place and actually um, is in this limbo for, for more than two decades. And so the Hornbostel collection is an interesting case study, case study when it returns, when, when part of the Hornbostel collection, so Hans Hornbostel was an amateur archeologist who collected, you could say probably more than 10,000 items when he was in Guam in the 1920s for the Bishop Museum. And a few hundred of those items were ancestral remains of Chamorros. And so in the 1990s, the Hornbostel, part of the Hornbostel collection, mainly the human remains component, the ancestral remains component re is returned, is repatriated to Guam. And this is an important moment. The Guam Museum is, even though it's in this tenuous limbo-like state, its facilities are upgraded in order to adequately um, protect the Hornbostel collection, in order to adequately maintain it. But even while this is an important moment in which the museum, in terms of its role of taking care of the artifacts, the heritage, the remains of the Chamorro people, that sort of the, monument, the monumentousness <laughs> of that only goes so far. As you can see here, uh, a predecessor of mine as a, cur as a curator of the museum, Tony Ramirez, upon the return of these uh, remains from the Bishop Museum, there was the idea, it was proposed, you know, it was conceptualized that there be a shrine, a naftan imanyanata, in which these remains and other remains could be interned, could be, could be given a final resting place. Because instead of sitting in warehouses, instead of sitting in, in poorly ventilated, not particularly well climate controlled sort of facilities, um, put them back in the ground, let them rest. You know, these are disturbed remains, put them to rest again. And so despite the repatriation of the Hornbostel collection being this highlight, it also highlights sort of the lack of resources, the lack of facilities, the lack of professional staff in which taking on these remains, which join thousands of others that the Guam Museum currently has, taking these things on though, but not having the staff in which you can properly maintain them, catalog them, but also perhaps um, sort of study them so that that which is kept sort of in these collections can also be utilized to help educate, to help enlighten about the ancestors of the Chamorro people. And so it isn't until about 10 years ago, actually uh, a little earlier than that, under Go Governor Felix Camacho, there is sort of a new push to create a Guam Museum. Um, you know, committees are started um, in which sort of to make it a reality. Under Governor Eddie Calvo, it does become a reality. And so this is a news piece um, from 2012 in which sort of the, the museum plan is being outlined. And you can he and you can see that the dream that Carlos Titano had appears to be coming true. In order to build the museum, we need the land. So <laughs> I want to thank you uh, for passing Bill 454-31. And this is an act to authorize Imagalang Guan to transfer Skinner Plaza presently under the control and supervision of Ilesatur Guan to the government of Guam for the purpose of construction and educational cultural facility. And with that, I will fix my signature and it shall become law. Thank you. Thank you. Bill 454 signed into law, providing the land on Skinner Plaza that's needed to build a Guam museum, finally. There's also, there's a great portion of the building on the bottom. Uh, that's raising the elevation of the museum above the floodplain. We're 11 feet above the sea level and two feet above the high point for the 100 year storm. So we're outside of the flood zone. 
Um, additionally, the third floor is where the repository for artifacts will be stored, and that'll be sealed without any windows, so rain intrusion during typhoons won't be an issue. Bids go out in November. In January, construction should begin to take shape. Guam Museum is going to be the most significant structure built on our island in the 21st century in regard to our culture, because it's going to showcase important pieces of our island's history and show the evolution of our culture, displaying artifacts from pre Ladi period, Spanish era, pre war Guam, and the modern era. In our surveys uh, in the tourism industry, um, we are getting a lot of feedback that they want to know more and experience more of our culture. And what better place to put uh, uh, our museum down in our capital and to be able to really showcase um, our rich heritage. There are high hopes that the museum will draw island residents and visitors back to Aganya and become the centerpiece for revitalizing the downtown area. For whatever the questions are and whether it's going to be built here or there, it's important now to understand that we're going to build this museum. And it will be a part of Agatnya. It will be that cornerstone for revitalization of our capital city. Uh, and with that, it will be, again, what I believe, bring life back to a city bring back the glory that once was. It'll cost $27 million to build, the money coming from last year's hot bond sale. So that $27 million of hot bond proceeds will go solely to the construction of the museum. And, and you know, as it turns out, uh, you know, the numbers are lining up very nicely that, as Ken mentioned, sticks and bricks and all the soft costs. We're looking at right around that amount to, to construct the museum. Completion. All right. And so... Like dispenser, okay. And so this um again, so some of the things that sort of are um so some of the things mentioned in that news piece are sort of echo things that we've already talked about. So on the one hand, the Guam Museum that ha has been built, um, the Guam Museum in which I currently work, the Guam Museum as it is today definitely sort of realizes the dream that Carlos Titano had, but also represents an evolution of this institution compared to when it is first started. And so this is the facility here, you know, in, in Skinner Plaza, right across from Plaza de España. It is a much larger facility than even Carlos Titano imagined. It has on the second floor, the Hinanauta exhibit, a permanent exhibit um, showcasing 3,500 years of Chamorro history, but it also has a changing gallery on the first floor in which uh, new, new exhibits uh, are put in uh, every couple of months. But it also has those facilities for lectures. So the Guam Museum has theater, it has a theater, it also has conference areas. And so the museum is a place in which there are film screenings, there are conferences, there are lectures, there are weddings, there are parties, all sorts of stuff like that. And one thing that I particularly love about the museum as it is today is, of course, that the museum begins in conversation, you know, almost a century ago, in connection to the loss and the demise of the Chamorro people, that sort of the heritage of the Chamorro people is, is becoming lost let us to stave the tide to you know to 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 for to, to sort of prevent this this oblivion that is that is approaching let's create this facility to hold the things so that even if we are gone even if we you know these connections to the past disappear they will be safe in this place for future generations to 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 touch to see to learn from what I love about the Guam Museum today, though, is that it's not so much focused on death or the demise, but it's focused on the living, the breathing Chamorro. It is a testament not to the end of the Chamorro people, but the continuing story of the Chamorro people. That's why the Hinanauta exhibit has that framework, first proposed by you know the late curator Tony Ramirez, that the museum is a companion to the Chamorro people as they move through time. Not something to represent sort of that, oh, we mark our, you know, we mark this and 
thank goodness this is here like a like the naftan paritautauta. No, the museum lives and breathes with the Chamorro people. The exhibits change, the conversation changes. The museum is a place for for serving the needs of a living, breathing, growing, and changing community. And so part of the goal of the museum, its mandates to educate, to be that space, this facility highlights that. This, this facility supports that and promotes that. The problem, though, is what about the other things that the museum is mandated to do? In the news coverage that we just saw, they mentioned, of course, the repository. They mentioned that this new facility, when it was being built, it would be able to store all of the, the archaeological collections of the Guam Museum. But this is where we start to see the limits of the Guam Museum. The Guam Museum has done nothing but grow over the years. And the new facility that the Guam Museum has been housed in, it is much larger than the museums of the past, but it is still quite small compared to what the museum needs in order to meet its mandate. The Guam Museum collection is, according to one estimate, more than 250,000 individual pieces. 70% of those pieces are the depository collection. This means artifacts, human remains, things that come from archaeological surveys, digs, construction, military construction, private construction, all of these things, as you can see here in these boxes, these are parts primarily of the depository collection, that the Guam Museum is the place in which these things have to be stored. But the problem is that the museum, as it has evolved over the years, it has a new facility which is much larger than any other version of the Guam Museum in the past, but it is still not large enough to actually hold all of the collections, archaeological collections that the museum is mandated to maintain and to watch over. Beyond that, though, the museum, as it has grown, has not evolved in terms of its resources or in terms of its staffing capacity. So that the museum has grown that sort of in 1965, Carlos Titano said that the museum had around 3,000, 4,000 items in it. Look at today with 250,000. The problem, though, is that the amount of money that the, the, that the Guam Museum receives and the staff that the Guam Museum um, is budgeted for or in law, the, the museum has, has not grown to match sort of the obligations that the museum has for its mandate. To give a good example of this, the, mu the, the staffing pattern for the Guam Museum today is of course that there are two curators, there's an administrator, there are two curator positions. There is, I can't think of a time that there have been two curators in working at the museum at the same time, but as of today, there is an administrator at the Guam Museum there is a curator, and then there are a number of assistants. And so maintaining, cataloging, preserving, researching, sort of creating uh, creating programs so that the public can learn from this amazing collection that the museum has requires a robust staff. And it's not simply the, the pure number too, but it requires specialized staff. A, muse, a collection of this size requires people who can handle the cataloging, the archiving, who can do the data, who who cannot, who who can sort of uh, handle the inventorying. Who there need to be curation techs, curation specialists, like all sorts of specialized skilled labor is required to properly maintain a collection like this, and so. It is for this reason, of course, that the Guam Cultural Repository represents the I, the sort of a great next step in this evolving process is that the Guam Museum has, for whatever, for a variety of reasons that I cannot get into, just has not evolved to 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 continue to meet the needs of its growing 
depository collection, although it's also referred to as the repository collection. And so what is needed then is another facility, another facility that can have that focus, that can have those facilities, that can have the staff in order to properly care for these, I you know, this part of the collection, hundreds of thousands of items, thousands of dis of distinct ancestral remains. And so Mananzan, Ipateku Gwini guest in a panel. See Zeus Masi put the attention means you. Thank you all uh for your attention. Um Joss, Sastiki Manali Hitala.